the TTS Talking Early Years podcast. Each week we'll be joined by educational experts from across the globe, offering exclusive insights, inspiration and guidance to help practitioners unlock the potential for learning in the early years. To hear about future episodes and access follow-up content, including ideas for your settings and more, sign up for exclusive access using the link in the podcast description. Well, hello, 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 hello. My name's Alice Sharp, your host for this week's TTS Talking Early Years podcast. Who am I? I would now describe myself, I think, as a trainer, an advisor, author, imagineer, disruptor, and a thinker. I started life as a civil servant, in fact, uh, in the nuclear industry, <laughs> my tiny little village where I lived to two missile bases at each end of the loch. However, I knew that was not for me very quickly uh, and became a primary teacher, then moved into early years reception, nursery, and I can't imagine it. Anything else eh, I'd rather be doing than working in early years. So we're here today. It's a fabulous little series. We are exploring the only way to learn, the best way to learn, play-based learning. In the early years, of course. We're using it, eh, this one here today, to turn a lens on how play supports the development of key skills for our children. I get the joy over these series of talking to a number of educational experts. And today I'm delighted to introduce you to Kate Freeman. So support, support, support. If I am to find out more and more, if us practitioners uh, that work every day with uh, babies, toddlers and young children, Kate, have to support and find out about things. I wonder if you could point us in the right direction. Like recently, I've only just found out um, I came across it when I was Googling something else, something called LUCID, the International Centre for Language and Communication Development. I had never found it before. And oh my gosh, you know, there's evidence briefings in it. There's case studies in, there's toolkits, there's magazine art, there's blogs, there's training videos, short talks. Extra, there's hundreds of stuff there yeah. that I didn't know was there, you know. And their, their tagline is transforming our understanding of how children learn and communicate with language. You know, so that's one that I certainly have been dipping into and, and, and finding out about. But what support is available for practitioners and parents yeah. as well, perhaps? And how do we access it? Well, there's lots online now. And also there's lots of campaigns around um, okay. supporting communication. So there's Tiny Happy People, which is a government campaign focusing on developing communication skills in the early years. And there's loads of activities, ideas, uh, videos, um, opportunity to kind of build a little timetable around talking times um, lots and lots and lots on there and actually um, to find everything on there is quite a task in itself so it's worth having a look at that there is also um, Hungry Little Minds um, yes I, I always get those two mixed up Tiny Happy People and Hungry Little Minds sorry Tiny Happy People is the BBC um, campaign Hungry Little Minds is the government campaign yeah. um, so both of those websites have a lot of information about how to support communication development um, what activities to do um, tips around interactive behavior there is also the NSPCC campaign which is chat play read again lots of information for parents on that lots of information that you could pass on to parents but also good for us um, as practitioners and they have both of the all of those campaigns have lots of information on the social media um so on instagram on facebook um i on tiktok i think um the um, okay. tiny happy people also do um then there are also if you look on certain areas um not all areas but certain areas speech language and uh, speech and language therapy websites there's lots of resources so i've got some li a list of uh really useful ones here i've got Cambridge here and Peterborough, they have a really good um, link for, they call it their speech and language therapy toolkit. Leeds does, Dover does, Gloucestershire does, and Halton in uh, near Liverpool does. They're all, they've all got really good websites that um, explain a lot about what speech language and communication needs looks like and how to support it. There is also um, some training that is available for free through the Early Years Send Partnership. So if you okay. look up um, speechandlanguage.org.uk forward slash slash EY send, then there are some videos, some webinars that you can access there for free um, and they're aimed at early years practitioners. 
So lots and lots and lots. I've developed a, um, a book uh, called Helping Children Find Their Voices, and that's really around the very early stages of language development. So probably going from babies um, to kind of two, three, four year olds. Obviously, it depends on the individual child, um, but that's really useful. And also that goes alongside that is some books that are aimed at toddlers um, okay. looking at linking words together because I discovered that actually there are lots of um, books that have single words in them so apple car banana all of that and then you move on to stories and there's nothing for that two word level which is really really important yeah the two word level is such an important level because um, children yes you can learn individual words but somehow you have to get from that to conversations and the way of doing it is via two words first and that should be happening around 18 months but so lots of children would that be Kate something like ball rolls or ball yeah. bounces or something like that do you mean? yeah so so the books are there's four books and they're around particular what we call pivot words you're getting we're getting very specialist now um, <laughs> but when children learn to join words together they normally take one word and then add other words to it so it might be say the word hello and in fact one of my books is called hello um, so it's you know hello teddy hello um bunny hello fish hello cat so they've got one word and they're okay. adding a different word to it each time okay. um and so that's a really useful way of yeah. linking children's words together and helping them to understand that it's not just about knowing individual words but actually we can put them all together in a whole sentence and i, and I guess what you're describing to me or to us is you know architects would never build a building on shaky foundations yeah. but we tend to think it's okay to build children's language on shaky foundations and we need to stop doing that really yeah you know and and so you know these simple little things that you're telling us well you know after 32 years of being a teacher and loving language and thinking okay I'm good at supporting language I'm actually revisiting so much to think well actually I need to pause and slow down I need to look at internally I need to look at me first of all what is it I do that's working what's not working is there a barrier I'm putting up and then I need to look outwards uh, to all of these lovely signposting that you've just done for us, you know, because the National Literacy Trust got loads, the Communication yeah. Trust got lots as well. Um, I was involved in a, a big campaign for Play Talk Read yeah. in Scotland um, over uh, five or six years, uh, you know, because one of the things that is going through my head just now when I'm listening to you is about the parents again, because we're signposting to practitioners, and that's probably most of our listeners. But for me, we have a huge amount of, of um, parents who don't access all of this stuff online, that they, they don't have the mental capacity to, to or they um, are not interested enough to do it. So, and, and they're really perhaps the parents of the children who need it more than, yeah. so it's, it's doubly important that as practitioners, we, we do what you're telling us or yeah. suggesting that will be helpful for the children to do because it might not be happening at home. Yes, and it's about trying to find ways that that's possible to happen at home. So not, you know, obviously for us saying, well, you've got to do this 10 minute activity or whatever, that can feel quite difficult, even just to fit in a 10 minute activity when you've got a busy home life and lots of things going on. And maybe, you know, there might be other issues that you're dealing with in terms yeah. of hunger and, you know, funding and maybe domestic violence and all of those things that are going that for some people are going on so to find 10 minutes is a very difficult thing to do but to build it into everyday uh, routines so you have to feed your children so let's think about how we use um, preparing food and sitting down together and having food as a way of having communication you know you have to get your child from um, home to the early years setting let's look at how we use that to focus on the things that we're seeing around us to talk about them putting their coat on and their shoes on and you know what going in the door and seeing whoever's in the, their early years setting it's about building that into part of their everyday routines rather than uh, parents feeling like they have another job to do um, but it's also about I suppose educating them to know that interaction is the most important thing so the downside of screens and tablets and phones is that you're not getting the interaction. Children literally are just watching a whole set of flashing lights, sounds, they're not learning from it because they're not interacting. And it's the interaction 
that is the way of, of developing the communication. Children just don't, we wouldn't sit and learn from listening to, a, um, we wouldn't learn Italian or whatever, or Gujarati from just listening to a book read in Gujarati. We wouldn't learn it that way. Yeah. We have to have somebody to talk to us about what those words mean and to interact with us. And it's the same for children. And, and I think we, we work with parents in our job and, you know, making it fun and say, you know, that you said one of your little books is hello. And, uh, you know, to, to sit and say, hello, sauce, hello, salt, hello, saucer, you know, and to put, do that at the, at the table or hello, nappies, hello, cream, hello, mobile. You know, exactly. to, to do all of that would be so easy for the parents to do it. And I haven't yet met a parent who we have worked with that has not just went, wow, is that all I have to do? Yeah. You know, and, and so parents don't know what they don't know, but they're amazed and desperate to, to get it right. You know, yes, there'll be a, a couple that perhaps are not desperate to get it right, but on the whole, parents want to be the best parents they can possibly be. Yeah. And, and, and like sometimes I can remember when we sent, or when I was a young mum and my children were we getting sent home a massive big story sack you know, with a video and a book and a truck and a jigsaw. And I was terrified to lose any of it when actually sending home, you know, behind me, I've got six little coloured men. Um, I've got a yellow man, a blue man, a purple man, a green man. So, so say hello, purple, hello, yellow, hello, blue. Or, you know, that would be so simple for the parents to do. So if I'm going to send something home now, I'm thinking I'm going to send something, just one thing, two things home for them to do it. Yeah. yeah. And for a parent to see the, the impact that they're having on their child is an amazing thing. You know, often um, some of the parents that we're dealing with, they, you know, they might have had very poor parenting themselves. They might come from quite chaotic lives. Um, but to know that they are able to really impact on their child by just reducing the length of their sentences, by just yeah. talking about what they see in front of them, by just spending a bit of time playing with their child or, um, you know, talking about the routine that they're doing, or, you yeah. know, changing nappies or bath time or whatever it is, um, rather than it's being seen as a job that they have to do, to know that they are really impacting and then to hear their child laughing at them, giggling at them, you know, paying attention to them, saying I love you or, you know, just yeah. joining in a song or whatever it is, is a really lovely thing for a parent to be able to do yeah. um, and makes you feel great to be a parent. And absolutely, and of course, although we're talking about parents in this wee bit, as a practitioner, when the parent is not there, I step into the parent, you know, shoes, if you like. So yeah. it's really everything that we're talking about is as equally, if not more so, import, as important for me, the practitioner or teacher, um, to remember that we overcomplicate things sometimes I think you know I'm thinking about all of our different spaces that we create for children in the you know the in the home corner or in the um you know in the home corner I've got on the table I might have a mug but I've also got a cup and I've got a goblet in fact just now in the home corner and so there's three lovely little words that I can talk about um, and we can fill it or we can empty it and, and so you can do those add-on words that you're talking about really easily but if we've got 500 things in the home corner or you know we've got 18 different kinds of fruit because we're trying to build their vocabulary and name all the fruits that actually can get in the way perhaps can yeah. it? And sometimes I, I agree with you, it can. And I think sometimes we can focus much more on the things that we can put out rather yeah. than thinking about how are we going to use that. So in the same way, as I was saying, you know, you can't just listen to a story read in Gujarati to learn Gujarati. You can't just see the 500 fruit or whatever it is on the table and learn yeah. those words. It's how we as the practitioners are interacting with the children to help them learn that. So we often think, oh, you know, communication friendly environments, we need to make our communication when we need to make our environment communication friendly. Yeah. Well, there's no point in having a communication friendly environment unless you've got an adult in there who is interacting with the child in the appropriate way. It's the adult who makes the difference, not the toys. Not the environment, yeah. it's the adult who makes the difference. Yes, you we can. are the biggest resource a child has access to. And, exactly. You know, we need to remember that, don't we? Yeah, yeah. And I, I do think, because there's a lot of, um, again, pressure, I guess, on us in the early years to have, you know, a lot of the nurseries are told to have everything, every piece of equipment out so the children has sight of it. 
when actually that can a, a child can drown in that yeah, yeah. um you know it can be completely and utterly overwhelming um for the children so sometimes i think we have to peel not just the way we use our language back but peel the spaces that we create to use yeah. the language in contextually back as well because we just overload the children yeah and also if we have everything available to children i i you know i i do agree that it's important that children can choose things and um can select what it is that they want but if we have everything just there then there's no need for the child to ask us for anything yeah. so if, if we have something in a plastic box where they can see it through the box but they can't actually open the lid then they need to ask us and that mm -hmm. is interaction in itself uh, yeah. or we can talk to them about what you know what the different choices are and then help them um to discover it themselves but if it just yeah. everything is there often especially children who've got difficulties with understanding or maybe attention or maybe uh, on the autistic spectrum they'll just literally run from one place to another and they're not really gaining learning out of any of those they're just seeing the objects and you know picking the objects up you know, or throwing them around and, or whatever and, and I, I guess so at the beginning of of this little conversation we were talking about the support and you h highlighted so many um things online that were support but actually we can support ourselves as well yeah. by thinking about the spaces and places thinking about the resources we put out thinking about how we then scaffold the language around whatever resource we're contingently talking about mm -hmm. um and and so we're our own support as well as looking to all of the external support but mm -hmm. again that comes back Kate I guess to us giving ourselves time to do that yeah, and I was going to say if you if there's a, if it's possible to have a just a five minutes on speech and language at every staff meeting, um, or find a buddy that you can say, okay, can you just watch me for a while and I'll watch you for a while and see what you think. And we have to be brave to allow other people to do that and to to be able to accept feedback. But working out together, what is it that I could do that might support that child better? Um, we've, you know, we're all we're all open to learning. There are always things that we can improve on. And sometimes we just get into a habit of doing something in one way and having somebody from outside or you know somebody that we trust to look at what we're doing and say, mm, have you thought about doing it that yeah. way is really useful to us. So it's being brave. Uh, and having a staff team discussion, as you see, 15 minutes or 10 minutes about speech and language, but also about us recognising our capacity for language development ourselves because you know there's a lot of us who um have you know formulated our lives through the last three years um and we've got a lot of young students for instance who don't have the conversation skills and don't have the vocabulary um you know i was delivering training and and a young person said to me we call that a little plate we don't call that a saucer i've never used the word saucer before you know, and uh, I had a lovely conversation in a in a shop at the conveyor belt <laughs> uh, with a young man who was uh, putting my food through, and he was asking me the difference between a turnip and a sweet. And um, you know, and and so we don't all have a huge vocabulary ourselves, and and I guess that will then never will will not be able to model and demonstrate that effectively if we're not confident and brave and bold with it either. Yeah and, yeah, and we can find those things out, can't we? I was out yeah. with my grandson at the weekend and uh, we were there was a, a local farm that, well, it's a local agricultural college, but it also has an animal welfare section. Um, and there were some terrapins. And I was thinking, well, what's the difference between a, t a tortoise and a terrapin and a turtle? So, you know, us being curious about those words. And maybe it's something that you can find out together with, you know, I, I was talking to my grandson about that. Can we do that together? Can we find out together? Um, about what these different things are. Yeah. It's enjoying yeah, in fact, discovering. One of my colleagues, uh, one of my gurus, in fact, Juno Sullivan, uh, who runs London Early Years Foundation, um, she tells a lovely story, and I've actually heard her doing it with parents, um, about when they're, the children are going to the fish market with their parents. She, you know, if what you're having for tea tonight, we're having fish. Oh, well, and June always insists, do not go and ask, ask for cod, ask for the tilapia because it's a much more interesting word than cod. Yeah. <laughs> and I just think that's that, that's a lovely, you know, image to kind of think this child is going to go with her parent and look for a tilapia fish instead of a cod, yeah. uh, which is fab, yeah. Wow, once again, another little oh, burst of uh, hurting my head, making my head think, Kate. So that's fab. Support, 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 and it's everywhere around us. It and is. we can be our own support. Fabulous. Yeah.
So all that remains for me to do, Kate, is to say thank you so much for joining us on our TTS podcast. It has been a joy. Thank you.